Good evening. I think that was an appropriate song for us to start our evening with, where we are asking God to make us a blessing to someone. And I challenge you, after this evening, I challenge you, pick someone, someone you know, someone you have in mind, to offer to them to read God's Word together. I'm not going to preach this evening. Uh, My intent is to simulate um, in some way what I get to do um, regularly, almost daily, uh, in our context there in northwestern Spain. I'm nothing special, all right? I don't have great drawing skills or anything like that. Um, I love God, I love His Word, and I want my friends to see who Jesus is. That's my simple goal, that they would see who he is and what he desires of us. And so what we're going to do this evening requires um, participation, all right? Normally, it's me and someone else or up to uh, 10 or 12 people, not so many, all right? But that's okay. It just requires you answering questions or asking questions. I I don't promise to have all the answers, but I'll try. And if I don't have the answers, I'll default to Pastor Dan. And if he doesn't have the answers, you ask the really good question, okay? Um, So there are... Pastor Troy is next, that's right. There are no dumb questions, and I tell my friends that. This is... um, Everything goes. You can ask, all right? But I just don't guarantee to have the answer. One of the things that has helped me in my leading of Bible studies is having categories of questions in mind. Have you ever heard of the coma questions? It's not original to me. There was a book written by David Helm, and I think it's called one-to-one Bible reading. It's really small, well worth however much it costs. And it goes through these questions. The co- it, it, it's, um, I don't think it's even original to him. I want to say it started with the navigators. I could be wrong. At any rate, the coma questions are four categories. Context, observation, meaning, and application. Coma. Or in Spanish, we translate it to cosa. All right? Context. Questions of context are as simple as who wrote the book? What genre is the book in? Who did he write it to? So we're going to be in the Gospel of John. Let's just start there. Who wrote the book? Thank you. The Apostle. That's right, John. Let's not be confused with John the Baptist. That's an easy confusion, right? Um, Who did he write it to? To virtually everyone. And there's some details that actually happen to be in the text that we're going to look at um, that help us discern that he's not writing this to Jewish people. For instance, if you're a Jew, would you need to be explained what a rabbi is? No, you know what it is. But turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We're going to start in verse... 29. So we just answered a few questions. That's context, just to get our bearings a little bit. Now, part of context is looking back and looking forward, right? Situating the story that you're going to be reading together, story or um, whatever passage of Scripture, right? And situating it within the larger book, the genre, right? The book itself, or even the larger story, all of Scripture. I'm not trying to complicate this, but questions of observation. So we've done context, observation. Well, we kind of did that this morning as I preached. I brought out, I highlighted problems. So that's one question you could ask. What problems do you find in this text? What did you find is the solution to this text, to this, to this problem, rather? Right? Those are questions of observation. One of the best questions, David Helm says this, one of the best questions that you can ask is, What do you think? So as you sit down, God gives you the opportunity to read God's Word with your friend, with your neighbor, with your family member, with your daughter. What do you think, honey? Read the passage and ask that question and just wait. And let them them speak. They're looking, they're engaging God's Word. That's what you want. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. So they're engaging in God's Word. you got the recipe for 
God to do a work, if he is so gracious, to do a work in their heart. What's the recipe for change? His word, the spirit, right? Prayer and his people. Are you part of the people of God? Do you have the spirit in you? Is he at work? Are you reading truth, scripture? Pray for him. You have the perfect, the ingredients for a wonderful thing to happen. All right, so questions, observation, meaning. What does it say about the Trinity? You can go specifically for each member of the Trinity. Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit. What does it say in this text about that particular person of the Trinity? What does it say about humanity? What does it tell us about humanity? Right? An application. Well, now you're making a specific conclusion, right, towards something in your life. So question, uh, uh, context, observation, meaning, and application, all right? Those are my specific categories that I've stolen, uh, nothing new under the sun here. I've stolen, adapted, and used them however I want. I also like to ask specific text questions. So it's just... You're just, just being specific to the text that might not be specific to other texts. For instance, um, if you're reading in Jonah, maybe the questions that are specific about Jonah and Nineveh that you couldn't ask in the Gospel of Luke. All right, they're just text specific. All right, so John chapter 1. I presume you're already there. Why did I pick John? Um, well, because two days ago I was in Florida. And I was with a family that supports us. And uh, she was asking me the very same question, how do you do this? And I said, let's start in John. And so we literally, we sat down in their living room and we started walking through John together. We read John chapter 1 through verse 18. That's the prologue, the introduction, gives the highlights, the bullet points to what is going to be developing in this, in this narrative. It's, there's tons that are packed, a lot that is packed in there. So if you don't understand it all, it's okay. It's not meant to be understood all at once. you got to read through the story, right? It's kind of like if you went to um, a play at a theater, right? The curtain is closed. Someone comes out and says, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to such and such a play. This evening you're going to enjoy intrigue, murder, some humor. Oh, I won't tell you more. Without further ado, they walk off. Curtains open and the play develops. That's what the prologue does. It gives you the highlights, the bullet points, right? So now you're interested. I want to know the answer. We got to keep reading. Well, this is what we did just a couple days ago. We actually made it all the way to verse uh, 28. We stopped there. So I'm just going to continue on from where we left off with you folks in verse 29. What has happened? Here's my first question, and you get to answer. What has happened between verse 19 and 28? Somebody just glance through it, and then we'll start reading the text together. I typically ask this question because I've been reading with one person. What do you remember about last week? What comes to mind about what we, what we saw? So what's happened? Just anybody, anybody. Don't be afraid. Okay, they're questioning about why, who are you? Who's given you this authority, right? And, and they're coming to John the Baptist. The religious leaders, they kind of have their pecking order. Apparently, they've sent some of their minions, right? And they're going from Jerusalem. They're going to see John, and John is... Where is John? Look at verse 28. This just situates us, orients us, right, in our, in geographically. Where is he? In Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, right? Um, there's two different Bethanies. One is just outside of Jerusalem, and then there's another one on the other side of the Jordan River. That kind of comes into play. It's kind of important because later on, in John chapter 11, Lazarus is in Bethany, but not the Bethany where John the Baptist is, the Bethany near Jerusalem, all right? Um, okay, so we've situated ourselves there. They're asking, who are you? John actually never gives an answer to who who he is. Did you, have you ever realized that or noticed that? 
Ask, who are you that we may go tell, you know, our superiors? And he says, I am not the Christ. Well, that's a funny answer. You know, if I asked Victor, Victor, if I asked Victor, who are you? And he said, well, I'm not Dan. What's up with that? All right. I asked, who are you? John never answers the question. He rather leaves this a question in their mind. They're looking for someone. Right? The idea is they're looking for, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Amongst you is someone, right? Well, who is this someone? And how can we identify this someone that is special, right? On whom the Spirit descends. We need to identify him, right? Now, here's a question I I like to ask my friends What would happen if we don't identify Jesus? Correctly. What would happen? You could just spit out whatever comes to your mind. Something about salvation. Nice and loud. We would miss the way of salvation, yes. We would miss salvation. Okay, what else? What happens if we don't identify Jesus correctly? Yeah, yeah. Um, another problem would be, what if I am propagating false teachings on Jesus about him? I have friends who say, well, he wasn't a historical figure, or um, all kinds of stuff come up. Well, how do we identify him correctly? Well, let's go to the source. That's what I tell my friends. Maybe we should go to the source and see how others who saw him identify him, and how he himself identifies himself. So let's read our first paragraph, okay? Uh, Verse 29 through verse 34. We normally share the reading. I don't do all the reading. I normally don't do all this type of talking, right? But I want you to feel comfortable. And so I'm going to ask someone, nice and loud, stand up and read verse 29 through verse 34. Pastor Dan has a strong voice, so he can't read. It has to be someone else. Yes, sir, go ahead. And the next day John seeth Jesus coming on to him and saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is conferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit, Descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Up to verse uh, verse 34, you finished. Uh, 34, one more. And I knew not, but he that sent thee to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Excellent. Okay. I told you I'm not a very good um, artist, right? That's okay. All right? We want to see how these characters, these individuals, identify Jesus. So what is it that John says about Jesus? How does it look up there? Yeah, okay. Okay, son of God. What does that mean? Not a trick question. Okay, well, he's the Lamb of God. Let's start with that one. All right, so there's my Lamb, right? And he he removes sin, right? But he's the Lamb that comes from where? From heaven. The Lamb from the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now, that's a little bit strange, right? If I saw... Um, who can I pick on? If I saw Kevin walking along the street and I said, Behold the Lamb. Now, remember, most of our friends don't have biblical knowledge, right? But I'm assuming that you do. What were lambs mostly used for? Sacrifice, right? We got to think of the Old Testament. Yes, they ate lamb. Yes, they probably used the wool. But they're thinking sacrifice. And what was that sacrifice generally for? Sins, but he's saying here is the lamb that comes from God 
and he is to remove sins. So we're identifying Jesus. We know one thing. This is the one that God has sent who is to remove sins. We have to trust that, right? We trust that he can remove guilt, that he can remove sin. Okay, somebody else said the other one, where he says at the very end, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Well, that's another way of saying he is equal to God. He is God. All right? This is going to appear over and over and over again. This doesn't mean that he was born out of God, right? Like my son, Lucas, is no. This is, this is um, referring to the unity that there is in the Trinity and that he is God. And that's a development from the prologue. Look at chapter 1. So this is where I would remind my friends and I would say, hey, does that sound familiar to something that we read in our introduction? Look at John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. We've already developed with my friends that the Word refers to Jesus because verse 17 identifies him. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, it's not the same to be with and to be. How can you be and be with at the same time? That's the Trinity. We're developing this, right? So he is God. Now, there's something else that John says in here. Going back to the passage that we read, what else does, what else does he say about Jesus? Look at verse 30. This is he of whom I said, and what does he say? I'm reading the ESV. doesn't matter what translation you have necessarily. Okay, he's a man. What else? Okay, that's a little bit odd. How can, let's see, who was born first? John the Baptist. He's the cousin, right? Is it second cousin? Correct me. He's cousin, right? Jesus' cousin. There you go. Troy, where are you? Back us up. <laughs> okay. You get the point. They're relatives. Who was born first? John. Then comes Jesus. But then he says something about Jesus. He was before me. And that gives Jesus what? Rank. Right? My, my verse says here, After me comes a man who ranks before me or above me because he was before me. What? How is it that he's born after, but he was before me, and therefore he has higher rank. Well, look at John chapter 1, verse 2. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Oh, he's before creation. You see that? He's the creator. And to be the creator, you have to be before creation, right? So this is, this is my little drawing to help me understand Rank, all right? I told you I don't have very good drawing skills, but that's like the little rank badges, okay? Why do I draw this out? Well, it helps me. I get nervous in Bible studies too, right? And when we're both looking down at the page, it kind of helps, right? It eases the tension. It also helps draw out what we're seeing, right? Literally. We're drawing it out, right? Or he is, or she is drawing it out. And we're working together. And sometimes they're like, no, no, I think we should draw it this way. Great. We're meditating on God's word. I save the drawing. And then we come back to it and we like, do you remember what we saw last week? The drawings easily bring back to memory what we have studied. So you don't have to be this superb artist. Just be willing to try. Um, another author, he says, um, this is uh, Greg Kokel in his book Tactics. He says, the more you practice, the more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. So just practice. Maybe go home and I, I literally, before I sat down, uh, before I came up here, I was just kind of thinking through, drawing out, how do I want to do this tonight? And you know, so I'm practicing. That way I bleed less in front of you guys, right? So practice it.
All right? Okay. Um, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Wait, 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 wait. John and Jesus, what was their relationship? Cousins. How is it that John doesn't know him? In what sense? If they're cousins, they know each other. In what sense does he not know him? What needs to happen for him to know who Jesus is? Maybe that's a better question. Something needs to happen. Here's, here's, here's my hint. The Spirit needs to... Watch what it says. Um, I did not know him. I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Oh, when I have the appropriate sign, now I know who it is. Now I have the appropriate sign, it's my cousin. Right? And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. All right, so we've identified a few things about Jesus. What would happen if we don't identify him? Well, we could easily be wasting our time. Let's make sure that we identify him well. Let me back up. I normally share this true story, not from me, but from someone else, of a gentleman uh, in England. I believe he was in London. He went out to eat at a very fancy, pricey restaurant. And while he was there, he, he walked in, and you have the waiter, and the waiter said, uh, welcome to our restaurant. Uh, sir, do you have a reservation? No, I don't. Would you happen to have an open table? And he says, let me check. One moment. So the waiter goes back in, and the gentleman sits down, and in walks another man and sits down beside him. And they exchanged pleasantries, hello, good afternoon, whatever. you know. And uh, the waiter comes out after a few minutes, looks at the second gentleman and says, ah, Prince William, we have your table. Come here. Come through right here. And the first man thought, oh, that was royalty. I didn't recognize him. I could have asked him what it's like to live in Buckingham Palace, what it's like to be married to whoever he's married to. You know, all these questions that he wanted to ask and could have asked, but because he didn't identify him, he wasted his time. Right? That's my illustration that I wanted to share with you about identifying Jesus. Let's not waste our time. Let's see who he is Right? from Scripture. So we've identified Three things. One, we have the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world away. Right? He's our sacrifice. And we, what do we do with that? Will we either trust it or reject it? Right? He is God, the Son of God, equal to God. What do you do with God? You worship God. That's what you do with God. You worship God. And He is rank. He has rank. He holds rank. What do you do with someone who holds rank? You respect them. You honor them, right? So we're just developing this a little bit further. Let's go on to the next section. 35 now through 42. Someone else would be willing, nice and loud, to read this passage, 35 through 42. Be looking for those hints or those identifiers. Thank you, John. Again, the next day after John stood and the two others and the two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, or being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found Messiah which is being interpreted to Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld them, 
him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cyprus, which is by interpretation a stone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. All right, how, do, uh, how does John and other individuals here identify Jesus? What do they say about him? Say it again. Okay, Lamb of God. So we have a, a second time, right? Two times. Repetition is oftentimes used for emphasis. Old and New Testament, right? When you find something is repeated over and over and over and over again, ooh, pay attention. I like to, you know, if you're doing digital, use you know, hi digital highlighters. If you like to write in your Bible, circle it, square it, underline it, whatever. Repetition is often used for emphasis, okay? So what else? Simon Peter is joining him. Okay, Simon Peter is joining him. How do they call Jesus? Rabbi, teacher, okay? So here is my attempt at what I'm standing behind, okay? Teacher, what do you do with a teacher? You listen to him. He's got something to give to me, to deliver. And what do I do? I need to pay attention. I need to listen. Okay, what else? Messiah, which means? Christ. You don't have to explain that to a Jew, right? This is for non-Jews who are reading this. Same thing with rabbi. Okay, so he's the Christ. Now, if you're like me, I, for a long time, thought that Christ was his last name. John Templeton, Jesus Christ. It's not his last name. It's not Jesus' last name. What does Christ mean? King. King. That's right. Or Old Testament, the anointed one, right? So let's put a crown, right? And here's my attempt at a bottle. Can you think of someone in the Old Testament who was anointed? David. Now, not only were kings anointed, but also some prophets were anointed. Normally, they were given a position, a, a charge uh, to have authority over, right? And so this is the, the chosen one, the anointed one for a specific purpose. Now, this is the Messiah, the one we are looking for, and he is anointed to be king. Okay, what do you do with a king? You serve him. You obey him. Ten points for pastor. Good. All right, so we're learning. Okay, if he teaches, I listen. If he's God, I worship. If he's higher in rank, then I honor, I respect. Right? If he is king, then I serve. I obey him. This is really simple. Do you, you see that? I hope this isn't like mind-blowing to any of us. We see this very easily. All right? And these are disciples from John... And where are they going? They're being introduced to whom? To? I don't hear well. To Jesus. And they're leaving John. They were following him. And now they're going to be following Jesus. Right? That's basically it. So we have these different individuals who are identifying Jesus. And now they are following him. Let's now read 43. This is a little bit longer. 43 through 51. And notice here how someone misidentifies Jesus and the conclusions that he comes to. So we actually have an example not only of correctly identifying, but wrongly identifying Jesus. Okay? Someone else, nice and loud, read these verses? Young or old? Man or woman? Yes, ma'am. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus said unto him, Come and see. 
is a sword that turned out from the Ephesian and is made of wood. People and Israelites were doing in whom there was no doubt. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that day for thee, when thou were under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I say unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believe thou, thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hence after you shall see heaven open, and the angel of God ascending, and descending upon the Son of Man. Wonderful. Thank you, sister. Thank you for reading that. All right, so who's the first character that we find here in our story? Philip. And what does Philip say to Nathaniel about Jesus? He found the Messiah, right? Philip found Nathaniel. He said to him, we have found, okay, but it's more specific. Okay, I'll read it. He says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Whoa. Don't skip over that. What is he saying? In your own words. Okay, he was foretold. What did you say, Victor? He was promised. Okay, so let's put this here. All right. What do you think that stands for? Yeah, so we got the scriptures, the, the prophets. The prophets and the Ten Commandments. Who wrote the Ten Commandments? Moses. God through Moses, right, yeah. Okay, so Moses wrote the Ten Commandments. And uh, uh, commonly, the first five books were the books of the... Law. So this was shorthand for saying the law, the Pentateuch, right? The first five, five books. And when they included the prophets, it's like saying all of Scripture, right? All of it is talking about this one man that we're looking for, right? The whole Old Testament, which, by the way, was the only Bible they had, right? They didn't have New Testament. It was just Old Testament. And so he's saying... The one we've been looking for, the one that's been foretold, the one that's the Messiah, he's here. That was a big, huge statement, right? He says that to him. Now, how does Nathaniel react? Verse 46. Okay, in your own words, what does that mean? He's skeptical, yes. Somebody said something over here. Eh, no way. If the Messiah is going to come from somewhere, he's not going to come from the little town of Ogden. He's going to come from Philadelphia, New York City, Washington, D.C., right? He's not going to come from Nazareth, that little town lost up in the hills. He's going to come from somewhere important, important people, important places. He's not just skeptical. There's prejudice here. Do you see that? Yes, he's skeptical. This is one of the ironic statements in the Gospel of John. There's seven strong ironies that John likes to bring out. Not only seven miracles, but seven ironies. Can anything good come from Nazareth? The answer is, oh, you better believe it. Right? Um, there's another irony in chapter 4. The woman at the well says, what, are you greater than our father Jacob? Uh, yeah, right? The, the irony is yes, but it's left hanging there, right? Now, he is prejudiced. He has misidentified Jesus. Can anything good? Wow, he's already labeled him as he's no good. Do you see that? This guy is, 
racist isn't the right word, I think partial is the right word here, and skeptical, all because he didn't identify Jesus well. So verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And how does Nathanael respond? Again, he's a questioner, right? He doubts everything. How do you know me, right? Who do you think you are, right? Um, how do you know me, Jesus, Jesus answered him. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of the Jews. How does Nathanael now identify Jesus? What does he call him? Rabbi, okay, so we got a second time, Rabbi. What else? Son of God? Son of God, okay, so we got a third time. Oop. A king of Israel. All right, you know what? Eh, I'll just do it this way. There's my star, David, okay? King of Israel. Whoa, now that's a huge change. You just went from being prejudiced to now all of a sudden saying, Messiah, our Messiah, King of Israel, my teacher, the one I need to listen to, uh, the, the um, Son of God. Actually, it's not here. I made that mistake. Right? Son of God. God? That's huge. What did... Jesus see Nathanael doing underneath the fig tree that we would see this 180 degree change. What did he see? It doesn't say. So I don't want to say what it doesn't say, right? But whatever he saw and Nathanael realized, it was sufficient for him to say, oh my goodness. I was really wrong. I had an idea of who Jesus is, and it's not who I thought he was. In some ways, I think this is a little bit of an invitation from John, very astutely, very wisely putting in here. Be careful. As you keep reading, you too might change. You might too change your opinion of who Jesus is. If you keep reading, you might be like Nathaniel. So, just a word of caution. If you don't want to change, don't keep reading. I tell my friends that. If you don't want to see change in your life, just say stop. But, this is a word of caution. Something happened there. We don't know what it is, but whatever it was, a skeptical man who is prejudiced against Jesus suddenly is saying, that's my king, that's my God, that's my teacher. Wow. That, that's a pretty potent... Testimony, you could say. Let's keep going. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. There's that invitation from John. Oh, because you, you, you heard me say that, you believe? You just wait. And, and John builds up these miracles. We saw this morning the first sign, right? What would be more impactful more, quote-unquote, miraculous than changing water into wine? What, what would be a, a more impactful miracle? Raising someone from the dead. That's Lazarus. What's even more impactful than that? Raising yourself from the dead. Whoa! So you have these miracles that are just building on each other um, with intensity, leading you to... Jesus coming out of the tomb, rising from the dead, right? So, be careful. You don't want to see change in your own life. Just stop. I'm just warning you. <laughs> okay. In verse 51, now this is Jesus' self-identifier. How does he identify himself? Anybody, it's okay. Son of man. What does that mean? Where does that come from? Somebody read Daniel, I think it's chapter 7. This is a title from the Old Testament. 
I believe it's verse 13. Yes, 13 and 14. Go ahead. Uh, verse 14 as well. Amen. The Son of Man is a title that comes from Daniel. Daniel has a vision in chapter 7, and this is what he saw, right? I saw in this night vision, and he describes it. One like a man, or the Son of Man. And how does it describe the Son of Man, especially in verse 14? What does it say about him? What does the Son of Man have? Dominion. dominion. What is dominion? Everlasting dominion, right? He can rule, but it's a rule that doesn't end. It just it keeps going and going, right? Like the Energizer Bunny, right? What else? Real nice and loud. His kingdom will not be destroyed. Meaning, the implication is somebody's going to try to destroy it but they can't. They won't be able to, right? What does he receive? What does the Son of Man receive, according to right at the beginning, verse 14? Glory. Yeah. Glory. And all the peoples and nations and language will do what? Serve him. They'll worship him. That's an extremely high title. He has a kingdom that is unending. He has a kingdom that is indestructible. Did I say that right? Indestructible? He, he, is, um, he is worthy of service, worship, glory. And that's how Jesus identifies himself, right? Now, back up just a little bit. We kind of blew past it, but verse 51, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay. Does that ring a bell? Have you heard any story in the Old Testament that sounds vaguely familiar to you? Jacob. Okay, Jacob is running from who? His brother Esau, because he tricked him, the deceiver, stole the birthright, right? And he's fleeing from his brother, and at night he lays his head on a rock, and he has a dream. And what's that dream? The ladder of heaven, right? And what's happening on that ladder? Okay, so we have angels. Here's my nice angels. They're going up and down. Okay, we're, rem we're remembering that passage in Genesis. I don't remember exactly where it is offhand. 28. All right, but now go back to John chapter 1, verse 51. What element is missing here? The ladder. But there is a ladder. Who's the ladder? Jesus is the ladder. They ascend and descend on Jesus. He's the one that connects heaven and earth. He's the one who is the bridge, right? He's the mediator. He is, I'm trying to draw a cross here, the ladder. That's a big deal. Just simply walking through, we have seen Jesus as all of these things. He is, I'm just going to go around the circle here. He is the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world away. He's from God. He's my substitute. What do I do? What should we do? We trust. That's, that's, that's Him. He is God. What do I do? I worship God. He is higher in rank than me. What do I do? I honor. I respect Him. He is rabbi, teacher, master. What do I do? I listen. He is king. 
He is king with a dominion that stands, that lasts, that's unending, right? Unconquerable. What do I do? Well, I obey. I submit to him. He's the one who has been prophesied about. I believe it, right? And he is the one who bridges the gap. He is the one who rescues me from myself, who restores that relationship with God in heaven that has been lost at creation. This is, this is fun. We just simply walk through it and draw it out. That's all we do. Week after week, we just, a napkin, literally, just pull it out and with a pen. Now, I have a favorite pen that draws really well on napkins. Find your favorite pen, right? Brothers and sisters, I hope that this just takes a little bit of the fear away from saying, hey, will you read it with me? Yeah, I encourage you to read the passage beforehand when you get together with someone. But you can do it in a park. You can do it at your home, at their home, at Starbucks, wherever. Just like Nike says, just do it, right? Just do it. Pick one person and pray. One person and pray. God, help me to be bold. Give me the opportunity to say, will you read it with me? And I think you will be quite surprised. God will give you that opportunity. He will answer. And then you're going to be like, oh, no, now what do I do? Okay, we took the edge off of the fear, right? And then you just find a time, a place, and just start. It doesn't have to be John. I personally like John. If I can, that's where I start. You can do it too. The more you sweat in practice, the less you bleed in battle. All right? Can I end here? Let's pray. God, you are good and kind. Thank you for letting us walk through the simple reading of your word. Um, I'm nothing uh, spectacular in this. I just want your son to be seen and known more and worshipped. He deserves more worshipers. He deserves more from every tribe, every language, every people. He deserves more worship. May we be bold, God, to go out amongst the nations. Yes, we're in the United States, but there are many nations here. May we just say to our neighbors, to our friends, to our coworkers, hey, would you read it with me? Give us boldness, Lord. Give us confidence that your word does penetrate into the innermost recesses of our heart and that it can change, not just our friends, but us. You can convict us of sin, and that's a good thing, all because we read it with our friends, and they help us, and we help them, and we grow together in knowing who Jesus is. In Jesus' name, amen.